Welcome to the Dakota Live podcast. I'm your host, Robert Morier. The goal of this podcast is to help you better know the people behind investment decisions. We introduce you to chief investment officers, manager research professionals, and other players in the industry who will help you sell in between the lines and better understand the investment sales ecosystem. If you're not familiar with Dakota and their Dakota Live content, please check out dakota.com to learn more about their services. Uh, Before we get started, I need to read a brief disclosure. This content is provided for informational purposes and should not be relied upon as recommendations or advice about investing in securities. All investments involve risk and may lose money. Dakota does not guarantee the accuracy of any of the information provided by the speaker who is not affiliated with Dakota. Not a solicitation, testimonial, or an endorsement by Dakota or its affiliates. Nothing herein is intended to indicate approval, support, or a recommendation of the investment advisor or its supervised persons by Dakota. Today's episode is brought to you by Dakota Marketplace. Are you tired of constantly jumping between multiple databases and channels to find the right investment opportunities? Introducing Dakota Marketplace, the comprehensive institutional and intermediary database built by fundraisers for fundraisers. With Dakota Marketplace, you'll have access to all channels and asset classes in one place, saving you time and streamlining your fundraising process. Say goodbye to the frustration of searching through multiple databases and say hello to a seamless and efficient fundraising experience. Sign up now and see the difference Dakota Marketplace can make for you. Visit dakotamarketplace.com today. Well, I am thrilled to introduce our audience to Chris Tesson, founder, managing partner, and chief investment officer of Acuitous Investments. Chris, welcome to Philadelphia. Yeah, thank you. You Thanks did for it. having me. You made it. <laughs> I did make it. Most people who are tuning in, I think we'll probably release this next week. They're going to know what's been going on in the East Coast with the weather. So I think it's a, it's a big accomplishment that you were sitting here at the desk in Philadelphia coming out from Seattle. I appreciate it. I, it was a bit more treacherous than I had imagined. And uh, I didn't think a simple trip to Philadelphia and Harrisburg would, would be so. But um, uh, glad to be here and uh, hope everybody in the city remains safe. Lots yeah, of trees down. There are a lot of trees down. Well, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're safe. We're really excited to have this conversation with you. We have a lot of questions to ask uh, over the course of the next hour. Before we do, I'm going to read your biography for our audience, and then we'll get into it. Chris Teston is founder and managing partner of Acuitous Investments. He serves as CIO and lead portfolio manager of the small and microcap portfolios. Prior to founding Acuitous, he served as portfolio manager at Russell Investments with responsibility for the firm's U.S. microcap, small, and small mid-cap strategies. Prior to his tenure at Russell Investments, Chris held positions in asset management and investment research at Bear Stearns, Schroeder's, and Lehman Brothers. Chris holds a BA in economics and philosophy from Columbia University and an MBA in finance from Columbia Business School. He is a member of the Seattle Society of Financial Analysts and is a CFA charter holder. Outside of the office, uh, Chris has served on a number of nonprofit boards as president and treasurer. He calls the Seattle area home where he lives with his wife and four kids. And again, Chris, thank you for being here today in Philadelphia. It really is a pleasure. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Yeah, and congratulations on all your success. It's always exciting for me. I I teach at Drexel University's Close School of Entrepreneurship. So we talk about the entrepreneurial mindset all day. You know, we talk about what it takes to found a business, start your own thing, leave something more secure to something arguably very insecure, maybe at times. Uh, So it's great for me just personally to be interviewing an entrepreneur and somebody who's really done it as a founder. So thanks for being here. Thank you. Yeah, no, excited to talk about it. Glad to, um, you know, take in any direction you would like, but growing, starting, and uh, and nurturing Acuitous has been truly a, a labor of love. It's been an exciting time to be in the markets. Oh, good. Well, we're glad you're, you're there. Well, we generally don't substantiate rumors on this show, but we're going to start by asking you a little bit about how the Tesson family approaches Halloween. Because <laughs> your, 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 colleague, your colleague, Doug Porter, uh, you know, had shared something that I thought was great because we were talking before the show started that one of the most interesting things about this industry is that we talk, you know, very granularly about portfolios, portfolio management, asset allocation. But one of the jobs, particularly in your seat, is getting to know the people behind the process. And that's also what I love about this show. So tell us about the process of creating Halloween costumes for the (laughs) Tesson family every year. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, that's funny. Um, well, that sounds like my colleague sold me out. <laughs> he um, did. He did say it would generally be okay. So yeah, we no, it's quite, all, it's quite all right. <laughs> I think uh, we joke in our family sometimes that uh, the family motto is there's no kill like overkill. And so uh, <laughs> when it comes to uh, it doesn't matter whether it's pumpkins or Halloween costumes or 
um, you know, uh, birthday cakes when they were little. And now the kids are a bit older, so they don't embrace Halloween to the same degree they did. But there were some good costumes. I think my, one of my personal favorites was uh, sort of the Green Army Man, yeah. which was a a lot of time at, uh, you know, a surplus goods store, a lot of green paint. I think my child smelled like green spray paint for about a week. <laughs> Every time I sneezed, I'd have a green Kleenex. But uh, it was, um, that's just, a, a, you know, sort of, a, I think, you know, a way to express creativity outside the workplace. But um, where did that creativity stem from? I grew up in a, in a creative family, in a musical family. And um, we always had sort of interests outside of work and sports. I spent a lot of my time swimming. I swam in college, as I know you did. And outside of that, I really enjoyed um, music, creating, writing music. Um, and I was able to do that in college and a little bit afterwards. Um, but uh, there was always, I always had an interest in just creating things. It's interesting how that manifests in ways you never imagine when you have kids, of course, right? Because they come to you at, you know, 11 o'clock the night before and said, I need yeah. fill in the blank. <laughs> yeah. My, uh, I was thinking about when I, when I was going to ask that question, I was uh, thinking about my own experiences. And when my daughter was three going on four, she decided to change her costume the night before Halloween. Mm -hmm. She wanted to be a mummy. Oh. So the next morning I wrapped her in toilet paper because that was the extent of my creativity <laughs> right. at the time and put her out into a rainy day, which did not go well for anybody. <laughs> but she did get to be her mummy. Um, but that's interesting. Did you grow up in a musical family? Yeah, I did. Um, my father played piano. My, uh, my brother was a music major, vocal performance, music education. So, um, all of my family did musical theater. I was often too busy with sports to uh, um, to engage in theater and musical theater to that degree. But then I ended up actually doing it in um, in college. My final after my final swim meet in college, my senior year, I did a uh, a show at Columbia called the Varsity Show, um, which is a review, student run, student edited. A lot of people have gone on to great things from that show, which is really interesting and in, in the space of entertainment. And, uh, and many of us others have gone on to, you know, careers in finance and other things, but still think fondly of our days when we would, you know, sort of write songs, dance and make fun of, uh, the university culture at the time. <laughs> what were those days at the university? Like you studied economics and philosophy. So what, what were you thinking as it related to it's just career? I, I get that question right. a lot from students at an undergraduate studying entrepreneurship, economics and philosophy. Was it law or did you end up? No, I ended up doing economics and philosophy. I was interested in finance. Um, Columbia as a liberal arts school very much focuses on the core curriculum as you're, as you're going through your education and, and you're able to take classes in a wide variety of disciplines, which I really enjoyed. And the, the philosophy side, I enjoyed the reading. I remember reading years later, I think that, uh, you know, George Soros was a huge fan of Karl Popper um, and his falsificationism. And there were, I found lots of parallels in uh, finance and philosophy, but mainly it was a, it was a good way to learn how to write, <laughs> you know, lots of papers and, uh, and lots of thinking more broadly than, uh, economics was a bit more numbers and charts and graphs. And, um, so it was interesting because a lot of us from that program went into finance and we didn't have sort of the natural finance background. I'd never had an accounting course, for example, before business school. Um, but, uh, but it was a great way and a great place to, to learn to think. Yeah, that makes sense. Also argue, make yeah. an argument. You know, you're making cases now for portfolio managers for the portfolio. And I know over the course of your career, you've had to make lots of cases for managers, particularly earlier stage, which we'll talk more about. So I, I can imagine with the writing, also the critical thinking and, and you know, making the case. Yeah, yeah, there's no question. One of my close closest friends is also uh, in the business and went about it in a very roundabout way. He actually went on to be, get a PhD in, um, in philosophy. And then came around and now does uh, multi-manager investing um, with a former uh, um, professor at Columbia. So lots of ways to reach the same place. I agree, I was a history major, so I, I know it well. Well, your first two roles out of school were with Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns. So I look forward to talking to my students about the history of those two organizations and financial, <laughs> in the financial yeah. industry. I promise I had nothing to do with the, I, uh, the I know downfall you did. of both. But. And uh, if, if for our guests or for our audience rather, who were cross-referencing the years that you worked there, you had nothing to do with any yeah. of the events that took <laughs> right. place, but they were wonderful training grounds, you know, particularly at the time that you were working there. So when you think back on that experience, 
coming out as an economics and philosophy major, using those two organizations and the programs that they were able to, you know, offer you uh, to, to, to train you how to do that a- analytical work. What, what were those years like for you? I know you did your business, um, you got your MBA in between. No, it was a great training ground. <clears throat> I started at uh, Lehman Brothers just before they went public. Um, and uh, they, um, as a um, sort of junior portfolio manager um, and analyst on a, in a new asset management division that they were building. And it was really wonderful because I was the only junior person in the group. It was a very small group. Um, it was exciting. You know, um, it was sort of at the advent of, of computing. So there was, you know, hey, you, you're young, teach us Excel. And, and of course, it, it, we hadn't even learned Excel in, in, uh, uh, in school yet. And so it was, you know, like the spies like us learned doing surgery on the fly with the book <laughs> under the table. <laughs> um, but uh, so many things you learn on the fly and uh, um, in business. I had wonderful mentors there that taught me about investing and, and analysis. I started off mainly on the fixed income side and then through business school and some other experience, I moved to the equity side and equity research at Bear Stearns, which was the last place before I moved west to, uh, to Russell and then Acuitas. But, um, and that equity research um, was, uh, was a very intense, so what some people view as sort of a typical Wall Street, um, you know, lots of late nights taking cab. My wife was an investment banker um, at the time. So we'd share cabs home at two, three in the morning. We would uh, write, I was covering um, Amazon for the first analyst I worked for back when it was $12 a share and had a chance to meet um, leadership there and, and work with them. It was a really uh, exciting time. Um, and a most of, you know, the takeaway from it is I gained a host of skills from learning to write a note on a merger in a couple of hours for distribution the next morning um, to, uh, to learning to present to clients and, uh, and doing in-depth analysis. But mostly you remember the people you work with, as you know. Absolutely. So you were in New York City for a number of years. What, what ultimately precipitated the move to Seattle? Um, well, my wife is from Seattle. Okay. And so <laughs> that, always, that always helps. <laughs> That's right. Um, and uh, I love Seattle. It's a wonderful city. I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up in Midland, Michigan, Dow Chemicals headquarters, mm-hmm. uh, where my dad worked for 45 years. And um, I love New York City. I was there for 14 years um, in business school and afterwards. And then we were married and pregnant with our first, and we had to make a decision about where we wanted to stay and grow our career. And, um, and so we thought about moving out. It was either sort of, you know, kids and strollers in the city or move to the suburbs. And, um, and, uh, and it was also sort of a post 9-11 environment where we were starting to think about, you know, um, house, yard, kids, those sorts of things and, and moving out. We looked at a number of different cities. I remember going to Austin to visit a friend that was 112 in the shade. And <laughs> so I uh, lo- absolutely love the city, but at the time it wasn't the place for us. We moved where we had family and, um, and four kids later and a, and a business, there we are. Yeah. And, uh, and nearly eight years as a portfolio manager at Russell Investments. That's so congratulations. Right. What, what does it mean to be a portfolio manager at Russell? You know, Russell really prides itself on in-depth manager research. And I think that's where we cut our teeth. And we have this common heritage among a number of the uh, investment individuals at Acuitas. And uh, we really embraced that and learned a lot about sort of depth of fundamental research on investment managers there. And then the portfolio management role is really the, the final decision on allocation when it comes to the portfolios. Of course, Russell was founded as sort of the, the first, you know, pension consultant and then moved into this asset management business. And, and the, um, my time there was, uh, was great. Again, worked with many outstanding people and outstanding minds, great people to learn from um, in uh, building these portfolios, structuring them and hiring and firing managers for, uh, for clients benefit. So, um, and then really the, the move to, uh, acuitous and starting to think about launching my own firm was precipitated by feeling like there was an opportunity in the market, a time where we started to see demand for slightly more esoteric strategies. Um, large plans allocating to spaces like small and micro cap and thinking that multi-manager is a solution um, that creates an efficiency for them and 
it could be possible to launch a firm that focuses uniquely on this space. On the inefficient space, the inefficient yeah. areas of the market. That's right. And yep. so Microcap, for example, was our flagship and first product. And I managed assets with Microcap managers um, uh, previously at Russell. But um, really the, uh, um, the genesis of it was having a client say that they were interested uh, in this and the firm didn't want to move forward with launching a new product in the space. Of course, every product needs shelf space and every product, you know, then, the, then if it's on the shelf, it needs to be dusted and cared for and all these sorts of things. And, and you never know if it'll grow. So at a large firm, I think it's harder to embrace new and smaller products. They often go through an 80, 20, their existing products. Um, so uh, we thought there was a real opportunity in the space and, uh, and left to start Acuitous with no clients um, and <laughs> uh, raised some external capital um, to make a go of it. Tell us about that process, because obviously a lot of our um, listeners being part of this Dakota ecosystem are, are fundraisers. So they're trying to raise assets for the first time with new products or, you know, it might be a product that's been out of favor for a while. So they're going back to the market either way. It's, yeah. It could be an uphill battle. What were those first, you know, few months, few years like for you at Acuitous? Well, you know, starting a business, I think sometimes it felt like uh, you're stepping off of a diving board into a pool, what you hope at night and hoping there's water in the pool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then I gave that analogy once and my wife reminded me, she said, oh yes. And you were holding the hands of your children, your four children as well. <laughs> as my youngest had just been born. Um, but, uh, but no, it was very exciting. We had a lot of confidence in uh, our ability to gather assets. I had um, uh, one of my mentors in the space. I talked about the idea with him and I said, um, this is what I'm thinking about, and but I don't personally have the capital to start the business. And he said, well, there's, there's no shortage of capital in the world, but there is a shortage of great ideas. And I think this is a good idea. Um, and that really sort of gave me the, uh, uh, the confidence to push forward. So we ended up speaking to venture capital groups and others about raising money and ended up going with uh, raising money from friends and family and really using angel investors um, to fund it for the first few years. And that turned out to be um, turned out to be great for us. And those individuals that invested early have been great supporters of the business in addition because of their experience in the industry. For our audience who may be less familiar about Acuitous, would you mind giving an overview of the business? You would mention microcap is one of the yeah. areas that you're focusing on, but just you know a little bit more of a holistic view would be great. Yeah, Acuitous Investments, we are a boutique multi-management firm um, that manages money in uh, small and microcap uh, globally. That is our purview. We, uh, our flagship uh, initial product um, and the majority of our assets are in U.S. microcap. Um, we have extensive in experience in small cap as well. Um, we also manage international small cap and emerging market small cap products and for clients. And um, really, uh, the packaging is less important to us. Um, the research and the purview is probably what's most important. Um, so for what we wanted to do with the business is create an efficiency, especially for large clients, that these areas may represent a single line item, but to gain the exposure that they'd like, they might have to hire multiple managers. Um, and so to do that, of course, takes resources. And when it's a smaller allocation for a large plan, um, it makes more sense to outsource it. And of course, it's not a single decision, as you know, building a portfolio, it has to be monitored and nurtured managers. It's a very dynamic space. So you get something that's a smaller allocation, but much more dynamic, mm -hmm. requires that additional oversight and, and uh, multi-manager represents a tremendous efficiency. So we have clients that don't use multi-manager anywhere else. They've never used fund of funds, but they use Acuitous um, and have had a great experience with it because of the efficiency we bring. And of course we do the same thing that they do in many cases. We interview investment managers, we look at you know what the active management space looks like and, um, and speak the same language. So I think that we can be in many cases, a sort of an extension of staff for plans. That makes sense. How early stage then are you going in these managers? So if you think about Acuitous's approach to, to the sectors that you're mentioning, you know, particularly small cap, whether it's emerging markets or U.S. micro cap, how small will you invest, and, and how do you define that 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 small, if you will, emerging manager definition? In general, I'd say for emerging manager, we let the client define it. Um, 
for us, we're more interested in in the alpha. You know, really what's important to us is sourcing alpha and finding great investment managers. And often when we find a great investment manager, we can target them on the areas where they're going to have the most impact. So that may be down the cap spectrum. What we do that's unique is in many cases, we will source and seed new products. And so it doesn't necessarily mean the investment manager. Um, we're not looking to... Um, do venture capital uh, and and be the source of assets for the firm. We're more interested in the product, but this also means that we've been involved in many investment managers that uh, where we are day one. In some cases, we're the only assets. We have a product they're looking to spin out, and we're going to remain with them as a client. We're not taking an ownership stake, um, but we are willing to be very early and even alone with a number of managers in the assets uh, for an investment manager. I think that's unique. And when you remove some of these sort of hurdles that are often sort of false perceptions of safety, um, the five-year track record, the $500 million in assets, et cetera, because we retain the knowledge that we can freeze a portfolio's assets. If somebody, if a portfolio manager leaves or these, they hit the buy a bus scenario that sometimes people worry about, we can freeze the assets and move them efficiently through a uh, transition manager or on our own to another investment manager that we have in the bullpen. Um, we're not as worried about sort of the worst case scenario. And we feel those early days where a product is particularly, and even sometimes a firm, a, a boutique, has lower levels of assets, that's where the excess return is. That's where our research pointed. And so we've been much more aggressive about that. So the major vast majority, over 90% of the products that we've allocated to in a space like microcap, and this is true in international markets as well, um, we've been the seed assets for the product. Um, and I can go more into that later. Yeah, no, we're interested in hearing more about it. Just get, talking about the ownership, have you ever taken ownership or have you ever participated in the revenue growth of these early stage managers? No, no. I think um, we know firms that have done it and it, you know, it represents a potential conflict. It's a different business. Um, and I think it would be a business that would be separated from our core business because it affects the decision making of once you take an ownership stake, then you have to make the determination of when, how, how and when would you fire them. Mm -hmm. That's obviously going to impact, you know, your ownership stake as well. Um, so we've never done um, ownership stakes and managers. We're really only interested for in generating returns for our clients. That makes sense. I used to work with a, a U.S. microcap manager. His name Sam Didio. And he used to say that U.S. microcap is the private equity of public markets. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just curious, before we talk about your manager research process, which we're, we're very interested in, what's the case? Could you give me the case, I should say, for micro cap, whether it's domestic or abroad? Because yeah. it is such an interesting asset class, not part of a lot of policy benchmarks. True. It, it can be perceived as an off policy bet, if you will, you know, an allocation. So I'm, I'm really interested to hear what's the case from your perspective. Yeah, that's a, a great point. And, um, and I do believe that it is, it does sort of straddle this public private um, market. You know, when we were at Russell, we, they um, came out with the microcap benchmark and it gave investment managers a tool to measure themselves better. And it gave plan sponsors sort of a measure of what is this space? What do these companies look like? Um, and that's grown. There are companies now that are a billion dollars that are true microcap companies um, in, in market cap. Um, and so it has evolved. There are essentially two ways to look at microcap in a portfolio. Some people use them as sort of a uh, return kicker for their small cap. It's sort of the smaller end of small cap <clears throat> because some for, for many plans, the small cap is actually um, larger than they would imagine, doesn't mirror, doesn't look like the small cap benchmark. Managers tend to get buy bigger stocks. It becomes more mid-ish, smid. Um, and so it's a way to bring down market capitalization of their small cap exposure. Um, and then there is the uh, private equity alternative, sort of as a proxy for private equity, which we've written about extensively, extensively and have uh, information on our website about. But this is another way that we, and we have a large client that uses us actually in their private equity um, portfolio. We are a liquid alternative um, for private equity. Um, and, and it makes sense in the size and the makeup of the companies in the index um, of how it 
mirrors and correlates most highly with private equity. But really the, the most compelling thing about the space is the alpha opportunity. I mean, it is the richest corner of the equity markets and, um, for, for excess return. If you're going to manage money and you want inefficiencies that, that active managers talk about, down the market cap spectrum is where you'll find them. You know, I worked in equity research for a number of years and, and you know, uh, let's say you cover a large company like uh, Microsoft or something. There are dozens of analysts that cover just that company. There are firms that are dedicated to research on, a, on that one specific stock. But you go down the cap spectrum to a microcap company, sometimes there are no analysts. You know, if you go and take a, you know, meet management and sit down with the CFO and take a tour of the factory or whatever, get a mint at the ends, you are, <laughs> you know, you are royalty, right? Yeah. Um, because many people are not asking these questions. And so to get the marginal piece of information for the largest companies is really challenging. To get, to understand the company and their ability to execute on their plan for the smallest companies and talk to leadership uh, it's easier. It's, and we often liken it to, I uh, use the analogy of, you know, microcap managers are a bit like major league hitters versus minor league pitching, you know, because they are, they're in a much richer space. And so we really think that, that it's not just the case for the asset class. Like you want to have exposure to small mm -hmm. and now is a really interesting time because small is, you know, we think small is truly undervalued relative to large, but that's not always the case. It isn't just a tactical allocation is much more the alpha case. You mentioned talking with leadership. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you, you do go into those relationships, particularly your managers, since they're going down market cap, they have the ability to get those meetings, not with the head of investor relations, but with the founder, the CEO, yeah. the CFO, which begs the question as to whether or not there is an impact element to this. Are you engaging or are your managers actively engaging with these managers where there's, um, I hate to use the word activism, but-, yeah. it, but Suggestivism. It, it, great word. <laughs> that might, maybe that's the, uh, the title of our podcast, Suggestivism yeah. <laughs> with acuitous. It, it actually has a lot of impact. We have managers that specifically do this. Mm. Um, managers that we've used that say, uh, for example, in international markets, you know, put your financials in English, get out on the market, talk to these places, go to these geographies, spread the word about what you're doing. You, you have a great company, and you're, um, but you have a CEO who doesn't travel <clears throat> or you have a, a geography that doesn't know about you. You know, you don't get, you haven't ever been through Boston. You haven't ever done a road show. You haven't um, or at least uh, changed the way that you communicate about what you do um, because it isn't just build a great company and expect everybody to knock on your door. Um, so, and there are company, there are investment managers in microcap. Um, they definitely, with their investment into the company, they have communication with leadership. And that means that they can say, hey, this part of your business is a drag. You know, you need to monetize it, move on, explore strategic options. We're going to be, you know, uh, we're not generally activists or the, and our investment managers are not generally activists, but they're absolutely suggestivists and that they communicate with them. And it depends on the type of investment manager, obviously. Um, there's a whole range uh, of uh, types of styles and sub -styles. Um, and uh, but there are some that that, that uh, do get involved. Putting the cart uh, a little bit ahead of the horse, but I'm just curious: when you're constructing the portfolio, do you find that there's sector concentration in the microcap space? Or is is there more tech? Is there you know more telecom? Is there more of a certain sector? Just as a result of you know market dynamics, I, I would have said interest yeah. rates before, but you know it just uh, you're just considering yeah. what's happening in in the in the current envi environment. Do you find? that there's a challenge in you allocating to managers as a result of maybe some, some inherent biases from a sector perspective? The, we don't necessarily look at taking sector bets sort of from a tactical position. Um, there are managers who have preferences, themes that build up within. There are also the challenges of active management, especially when you manage to an index, as you know. Um, for example, the growth index and its large exposure to healthcare and and biotech stocks, you know, managers often aren't comfortable with 15 to 20% biotech stocks. They view it as sort of a binary outcome for many of these names. Um, and it's not the same sort of fundamental analysis that they do as simple as income statement, balance sheet, um, and understanding management. 
um, its approval processes and its efficacy of the drug and all those sorts of things that need to be taken into account, often better in the hands of medical professionals and, and specialists in the market that do this. Um, in the value space, for example, financials is a really large allocation. So managers have to have a view on banks. And uh, we have managers that detest small banks. <laughs> we <laughs> yeah. have managers that are exceptional in, in purchasing them and understanding where we are in the cycle and, and, uh, and which companies and geographies are going to uh, outperform. Um, so there are definitely sort of the biases of active management that the underlying managers have to manage against. Mm -hmm. And, you know, tech, healthcare, financials, those, you know, some of the big ones, uh, the allocations um, in the space, there is, you know, healthcare is a perfect example of down in, in small and micro cap, a weight that has moved significantly that managers, some find a great challenge and, um, and they've taken a range of approaches to it. Everything from some have taken a basket of stocks in the space to gain exposure to areas where they don't traditionally pick um, to just ignoring it and going active. And we really think microcap is a space where you you let the sales out, right? This is, <laughs> you put up the spinnaker and head. And um, the um, it isn't a place where you overly risk control the portfolio. Um, so our managers are active. And if anything, at the margin, we're pushing them for more concentration than we are balance. Because as a multi-manager, we can balance those things. You know, you get the seesaw and you can place the managers in different places and find the disciplines, put them together effectively. Um, we don't need the managers to try and balance the exposure and hug the index. So they're taking the concentration. Are they giving up the liquidity? Not necessarily. Um, some of it depends on where they operate. They're not into such illiquid names that we ever that we find we really have a problem. We've never had an issue with uh, with liquidity of the underlying managers, with flows or otherwise. So talk about the beginning of this process, sourcing these managers. Mm -hmm. Where do you find them? All places. I think the biggest thing is just to have an open door, you know, and to let people know that you're willing to talk to them early days. They often don't believe you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because it's hard to get meetings. Uh, I mean, we know people are inundated, yeah. you know, um, and you use uh, resources, resources like Dakota, which we actually use um, in order to find out more about the plan sponsors that you can target and talk to. And for us, um, using a, a database for the investment managers, um, like an investment, that's just a first step, right? That's um, running a screen is the easy part. You really need to know who's out there and have an ear to the ground. Um, and that means looking beyond the stated products um, into who's also able to run the products. So some of our best ideas have come from small cap managers that we talk to about running a more concentrated, smaller product. Mm -hmm. And it isn't just sort of spaghetti against the wall. It's often managers that we really think would excel at it. Um, and we could know that by perhaps in our early days, for example, prior to founding Acutus, I had an analyst I worked for run numbers on some managers that we liked and the performance of their names, uh, their sub $500 million market cap names. One manager, what we found was um, the, uh, that 80% of their alpha was generated by these names and their small cap product. This was a small cap value product. Mm -hmm. And so we went back to him and said, well, we just want that, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's it. And he said, well, I don't know if I would do that because I could only run $100 million in it. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's probably not something that, you know, I'm a one portfolio manager, three analyst kind of investment firm um, that might be stretching resources. But if we think about it, and then down the road, many of these managers think, okay, but this is also a farm team. This is also the bench for my small cap. These grow up to be your best names, right? Um, so we can have multi-year discussions about these things. Um, it isn't just a kind of one and done thing. But early in our life, we did an interview and said, we often think that the first years of an investment manager are the best years. Mm -hmm. And we want to be there because everyone comes to you with the, they've, you know, they've got the three to five year track record. They've got a couple hundred million in assets. They've got the marketer with the great hair and the great <laughs> handshake. And they come in and they say, and we've saw it a million times uh, in our previous organization, but um, the same goes everywhere. 
and they come in and say, here you are, here it all is. Mm -hmm. What I want is the returns that you just put up for the last five years. But I don't get that. I get today forward. And you're managing more money. It's harder. You're buying bigger names. Perhaps the exposures aren't the same as they were in the early days. Those are important things to look at. Um, so we're willing to go it alone in the early days, do the research, and then invest early with an investment manager. So what do you want from that first meeting then? If you know <laughs> it's, the first, it's, it's, yeah. it's that day forward, do you want a story? Do you yeah. want to know the person? Do you want to understand their character? What exactly are you looking for in those first, you know, one or two meetings? I, I think it's so easy uh, for marketing people, and I, I don't have as much gray hair, but I, I think I have an okay handshake. Yeah, yeah. But I've got a good pitch book, and I've got a pretty good right. narrative. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's a good story, yeah, but it's a good framework. Right. So, what do you look for in that first meeting? You know, we were once speaking to a consultant, and they asked us, "Well, how in an hour can you tell if they're a great manager or not?" And we sort of uh, chuckled and said, well, an hour, that's like the handshake. You know, that's just a, a nice to meet you. Um, so it's really the beginning of the process. And the first, and, and, and the initial meeting, we're, we're just information gathering, right? So initially it is send us the information, send us the portfolio, send us the, yes, the slide deck, et cetera. But a pretty slide deck sort of does not a great manager make. Mm -hmm. um, there, are, there are lots of great slide decks and terrible investment processes. Mm -hmm. um, and there are, um, there are many small investment managers that can barely put a sentence together, can't market their way out of a paper bag, but are exceptional investors. And so to get to that um, requires a number of conversations. It requires analysis into the attributes of the portfolio and how they make decisions and really sort of in-depth research. So... It's really the multiple meetings. It's the entire process, the, the multiple meetings. For initially, um, we want responsiveness and access to information and access to the key individuals. We want to speak to the portfolio manager. We want to speak to the uh, analysts, often independently at some point. Um, we want insight into uh, the structure, the organization, the, um, uh, you know, um, the ownership structure of it, all those sorts of things. But those, in a lot of ways, are boxes to check. Mm -hmm. And then we're diving into process. Mm -hmm. and, we're di and we'll understand that through the names in the portfolio. Mm -hmm. We've been, you know, like uh, some of us have, have done stock level research before. So we try to understand the framework around the decisions of the individual names. Managers love to talk names, but they all sound brilliant, right? Mm -hmm. This name is great. It's a 20% grower. It's cheap because no debt on the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. One takeaway from that, this is just an aside, but those great characteristics that most active managers talk about, you know, I got a, this great name, they're going to do this, they've got growth and low levels of, you know, high quality and low levels of debt, et cetera. Those attributes are all uh, great indicators, uh, perhaps in large cap more than down the cap spectrum. The, the quality of the company down the cap spectrum is actually has a higher correlation with excess return. So they're not loaded with debt. Loaded with debt for a large company like GM means you could buy a new plant or, or build a new plant and employ a bunch of people and grow your business. For a micro cap company, it may take you one step closer to bankruptcy, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, uh, so quality matters more. The attributes of the securities that they buy matter more. What we want to understand from an investment manager is um, how self-aware they are, how much knowledge they have of the space that they operate in and the characteristics it takes to win. And that's the context that we bring from years and decades of manager research. You must be such an interesting meeting for microcap. <laughs> I'll tell you why. Because most of uh, most microcap managers that I've met, when they're telling stock stories, nobody's ever heard of these stocks before. Mm -hmm. But you have, in all likelihood, at some point or another. So it must make uh, for an interesting conversation. And also, I think it's a good thing. It creates a discipline for the portfolio manager. A lot of times uh, when I've heard asset managers present, um, you know, they're, they're presenting as if they're operating in a silo. And they're not going to be part of a multi-manager portfolio with other micro-cap managers or with other small-cap managers. So the understanding, or at least maybe the, 
the perception is initially that they're going to be going at it alone. They're going to be completely diversified and R squared of, you know, very attractive. So it's going to be completely uncorrelated from the rest of the book. Um, but that's not the case for you. So there's a lot of thought that must have to go into those early meetings with you as to what you hold relative to what your peers hold. Yeah. And, and you know, um, managers are often convinced there, there are many ways to win for investment managers, as you know, um, having conducted manager meetings. And so managers are convinced often that uh, the the way that they've um, managed money, that their specific discipline and their specific substyle is optimal for whatever reason. Um, and it may be the case that, uh, you know, I often give the example of, of a small growth manager, for example. Um, and this uh, pertains to international markets as well as it does U.S. But there are, you know, the very high growth markets, the, the high momentum managers with high turnover that they win every 10 years or so. And they are in a wasteland until they're on the cover of Barron's. <laughs> 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 and, and then um, uh, because that corner of the market tends to win in more narrow environments, and when those factors pay, you can have 100% return kind of years and 50% excess returns, but you need to be very patient. In a multi-manager portfolio, you can use a manager like that at a lower weight and balance it. But they're also, like you said, they are uh, marketing to plans as a standalone manager as well. Often maybe as a, for a growth where the manager or the, the plan already has a core and a value or something like that. <clears throat> but the danger is that your eyes are drawn to that manager right after 2003, right after 1999, right, you know, and you say, wow, you know, geniuses. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Why did I not have this? Put this in the portfolio. As opposed to understanding, like, we just had the environment. Um, and I remember a narrow environment in 2007 where the high growth paid and some of the high growth managers didn't get the boost that they thought they did. And that was, you know, an environment that favored them. We can talk more about this later in buy and sell disciplines, but, um, but it was an environment that favored them where they didn't um, excel. And that's something you need to understand as well. So we try to remain objective by stepping back and understanding what kind of animal these managers are. Um, they are um, self-aware, but by beating their index, generating excess returns, they're hoping to draw eyeballs and meetings. Mm -hmm. um, and we're very much trying to understand how, um, you know, what their discipline will result in in different environments and how they would fit into a portfolio long term. Because we're not traders of managers, we're investors, you know, and we really look for a long term relationship with them. In addition to self awareness, what other characteristics will you look for in a meeting, those first meetings, really trying to get to know someone? Yeah. Um, well, I think, uh, you know, access and honesty are two big ones. Really um, understanding how the firm was launched, um, what the goals of leadership are, where these products fit into the portfolio. I think it's harder sometimes with larger organizations because a smaller product, whether it's their small cap product or a micro cap product, um, non-US, US, these products, um, they start out small. They're, they're a less important part of the business. And sometimes a product person comes along and says, don't need it anymore. And, and that happens. So we want to understand the commitment um, to the space, whether it's emerging market small cap or US U.S. microcap, um, and and really the process for us is um, gathering the information. Can start with a simple slide deck. Can start with the portfolio. Can start with for sometimes for us it's a paper portfolio mm -hmm. because we're talking about products that don't exist yet, mm -hmm. and um, and starting early with those and that begins the dialogue and then begins the sort of the fundamental manager research process mm -hmm. and that was and there's really no secret to that. So in the earliest days of our communication, we just want access and insight into their discipline. Um, and it can be helpful when you have a really responsive marketer who's knowledgeable about the space and the area they operate in and understands how they fit in the context of other managers. That's valuable. And there are really only, a, you know, there are a handful of great marketers out there who understand sort of the offering and where it fits into 
the world. Well, the other side of our audience that tunes in are asset allocators. And one of the things that I've heard uh, from those audience members, as well as our guests, is that manager research and asset allocation are not taught in very many places. They're not taught in business school. Uh, there are a few chapters of the CFA you know, levels, um, and there aren't really a lot of programs, even executive leadership or executive management programs out there that teach kind of the art and science of manager research. So this takes us into kind of our next suite of questions, which I, I think are important because it really is asking you in a way to kind of teach us what is the typical manager research underwriting process like? We talked about sourcing, but when you think about you know due diligence, well, let's say idea generation, sourcing through due diligence, and then ultimately into execution, we'll talk a little bit more about asset allocation, particularly given your extensive experience. But that manager research process, it's it's you know I don't want to say it's bespoke. There are a lot of characteristics that are involved that are very common and that we'll find amongst most of our guests. But still, every time we get to hear it from someone like yourself, it, it's a masterclass. So we we would welcome one as it relates to your underwriting process. I think it really begins with the idea generation. I'll start there, um, and then we can go more into the manager research. But uh, idea generation. Really, you have to cast the broadest net possible. Um, it isn't fair to just um, run a search based on, especially based on performance numbers, because what you'll get is dependent on the environment you just came through, of course, right? And so I think that's a mistake of so many so many folks of you know, looking in the rearview mirror and not spending enough time on sort of the discipline and understanding how uh, it's a very nebulous thing, how good an investment manager is. But on the front end, what you can do is cast a broader net. So when we looked at the initial uh, purview of managers when we were coming out with the uh, microcap index many years ago, we had 12 managers that we identified in a space like U.S. microcap. Mm -hmm. And now the you know there are 75 plus in the databases, but there are more than double that. Um, out there in existence, mm -hmm. and and definitely many more that are willing to manage capital in that space. So casting a broad net means going beyond the database, mm -hmm. um, and it's a challenge for plan sponsors because when you're doing a search, of course you're going to get, you know, you get brand names, you get big managers, you get uh, people with uh, the proper track record, you get, but many of our best investment managers had none of that before we allocated to them. And they turned out to be the highest alpha generating products that we owned. So you have to be willing to have those early conversations. And I would say for plan sponsors, it's hard because it's it's hard to gather the breadth and interview a range of investment managers, understanding what's out there and evaluating who is. And, and that's why we try to create this efficiency at, at Acuitous with the multi-manager products um, because it's simply hard if you just ran a screen and, uh, you know, even emerging market small cap or a space like that, um, where there aren't as many managers in the universe, you have to understand who's really out there and who's capable of managing, um, in order to then draw down to the most efficient set you would allocate to. And that's it's true for us. It's true for any plan sponsor. Um, but it takes, it takes dedicated effort. Um, and so I think by, being what I think are, we're the only multi-manager that really focuses on small and micro cap. And I think it's to our benefit because there are a large number of managers in the space, but you know, many, many more are running mid, mid, large areas that we don't focus on. And by focusing only on small and micro cap, we're able to narrow it down to a degree and cast a much broader net when it comes to idea generation. That makes sense. So once the uh, the idea has been set, you have the manager in the office, you've done those first two or three meetings, you you know who they are, you you, you see the self-awareness, the authenticity, the humility, uh, and, and now it's really start, it's time to start kicking the tires. Yeah. How do you do that when you do have a universe that, that is relatively more narrow? Yeah. So that same type of competitive peer group analysis might be a little shallower. So how do you go about that? Yeah, I think uh, the next phase, once we've started the manager research process, that is in-depth analysis of both quantitative and qualitative attributes of the manager, um, both very important. And we want to understand it also in the context of what we joke about, like the sort of the fourth dimension, which is time, because a, 
a manager at T plus one is not the same manager at time zero, right? Assets impact performance. I think we've all heard that. But to understand it best, you need to look back at, you can look at the research. You know, my former colleague and mentor, you know, Paul Greenwood wrote The Perils of Research many years ago about small managers Mm -hmm. doing better than larger managers, especially in a place like small cap. Mm -hmm. Um, So focusing on, um, you know, managers and and kind of the richest corner of the market is important, but um, looking at their attributes, not just in the context of what does it look like now, but what will it look like over time and how will assets impact that? Because Mm -hmm. at capacity, we're kind of capacity junkies and, At capacity, we're much less interested in a manager and it's not their capacity number. Mm -hmm. They might say they could run Mm -hmm. in their small cap product $5 billion and we'd say, well, you might be able to, but we don't want to be around for that. You know, for us, if you had a small cap product, we might be interested until you're a billion dollars or a billion and a half or depends on the manager and the strategy concentration, all those factors. Mm -hmm. Quantitatively, we're asking the questions about what they buy, talking about names with them, We're asking about decision-making, buy decisions, sell decisions, ownership structure of the firm, all these sorts of things. We have these in a formal document. We rank each of these attributes formally. We take it to an investment committee internally, and we present it to the investment group where there are four of us. Mm -hmm. Um, My colleague, Dennis Jensen, and uh, Doug Porter and Matt Neiman, who are both analysts and portfolio managers. And so all of us have a great deal of experience with investment managers and can poke holes in each other's um, stories. But someone is responsible for bringing that to the investment committee. And then we all ask questions about specifics of the investment manager. Um, And so there is a high bar to reach that sort of level of proposal to investment committee. Once it gets to investment committee, is it uh, it consensus? Is it uh, a benign dictatorship? (laughs) How does does it work in in terms of the- We generally don't move forward unless there's there's agreement on it's a very flat group and um, no one is afraid to speak up. And I think we generally don't move forward with a manager unless um, we've all sort of approved it. Um, and then there's, you know, of course, another bar for the portfolio managers who have the the final decision of who goes into a portfolio and who actually gets assets. But we're generally not taking a manager to, because we don't have any consulting, um, we're only interested uh, in investing with the manager or not. <clears throat> so if we're taking a manager as far as investment committee, we are interested in allocating to that manager. We're generally not doing, if we're having multiple conversations with you as an investment manager, we're generally interested in investing at some point. We may not have the assets for the product t- today, but uh, but the goal is to allocate to the managers who we have on our buy list. It sounds like you could write a great white paper on capacity and capacity <laughs> limits only because, you know, it's something that obviously, um, as you know well, because you ask it, you have to. Mm-hmm. But it, it's, it's uh, you know, it's an obligatory question in every RFP mm-hmm. and really every first or second meeting is, you know, even if you have $10 million and, you know, you have you think you have a capacity of $2.5 billion or $5 billion, you're you're still being asked, you know, how you think about capacity, even if you don't have the number. So I, I'm kind of taking this towards more of the cell discipline of your process. Mm-hmm. You've given us a, a very, uh, you know, interesting and insightful approach to how you how you kind of ultimately come to the conclusion as to investing in a manager. Um, and we're going to talk about how that all comes together in a second, how you size them. Mm-hmm. But before you size it, let's just say something's not working out. You know, if it's if it has to go, it could hit capacity. So it yeah. sounds like that's a trigger. Yeah. But um, I always think about this quote from this author I love. His name is Barry Hanna. He wrote mm-hmm. the small, uh, the short stories uh, called Airships. And Mm -hmm. he said, you you need to see a bit of hell now and then. (laughs) And when you see that hell, you've seen those managers who, you know, you thought they were going to do what they said they were going to do and they don't. Um, How do you, how do you get back to that joy? (laughs) (laughs) That's great. Yeah. Um, (laughs) One of our analysts at one point said, uh, you know, investing with manager, it's like um, a client asked us, do you fall in love with managers? And uh, this person shook his head and said, um, and uh, in a sort of cynical joking comment said, you know, sometimes it's like having a roommate, you know, 
it really exci- it's exciting early on. You're great friends, and then all of a sudden they start leaving their socks on the floor, <laughs> dishes in the sink, you know, those sorts of things. Yeah. You're gonna see under the hood. I like for, that. That's a good white paper. Be a better roommate. <laughs> yeah, that's right. How to be a better roommate? <laughs> you are going to uh, you're gonna see under the hood with these managers. So you want to get to it in the early days. Um, and there are managers where we've. Uh, allocated that over time did not embrace the opportunity to the degree we felt they did. Um, there was, um, or that we wanted them to. And that meant buying down in stocks that initially maybe had some overlap with a small cap product for a micro cap product, um, but eventually not enough unique names, um, not enough effort into the, uh, into the product. Eventually we parted ways. Um, there were, uh, We want a multi-year relationship with these managers, and many times we get them. There are a whole host of reasons for selling. Um, Capacity is clearly one of them. If we think the uh, buying and allocating to managers when they're early in their life cycle is core to our discipline and I think has helped us generate the returns that we have for clients. But as they approach capacity, we'll have the discussion. um, And we try to let managers know early on this is – this is our discipline. Uh, you're free to go um, fill up with assets um, as you grow, but um, we're generally less interested in the product as you're less able to maneuver the boat. Interesting. How about sizing? So the the, the real the real art, I guess you could say. Yeah. Maybe not. Maybe it's 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 a quantitative right. process for you as well. But when you think about sizing these managers as part of a multi manager portfolio within the same asset class. Uh, but what does that what does that process look like from you and your your and the team's perspective? Good question. And I think sizing is dependent on the manager's discipline as much as it is the characteristics of the manager. So there's art and science to it for sure. Um, you can find balance within a portfolio on a number of characteristics. We often try to uh, we talk about eliminating the uncompensated bets. So, if for example we don't have a view and don't want to make a tactical decision on things like sector, overall we'll be more neutral on sectors uh, than not. But we're also we know that these managers have the sales out their concentrated products, and even in aggregate, we're not likely to have you know exactly index like allocations. Mm-hmm. But there are characteristics, like I talked about earlier, that we do think pay. So, for example, quality pays, ROE, ROA, those sorts of characteristics. Um, Higher quality for these smaller companies tends to outperform lower quality. Companies with earnings outperform companies without earnings over over time. It's not to say we'll have a a zero allocation, but in aggregate, you'll get these characteristics. So, we sit down as a team with the investment managers and look at – uh, how to balance them in weights in the portfolio. But we also have to take into account the type of manager that they are. So, for example, I talked about that high growth manager. A really high growth manager that tends to win in a more narrow environment um, might be a lower weight because it's there's higher volatility in the returns. And so you might have them at a you know 8 or 10% weight, uh, and they could, given the right environment, be your greatest performer – But you'll see the other side of that, and you might see a longer dry spell, and so you will weight them accordingly, Um, whereas others might be more of an anchor in the core space, a more diversified portfolio, um, and more diversified could be, you know, 50, 75 names for for our managers sometimes, but, um, uh, and could be higher, but generally... um, those managers can serve as, serve as an anchor, a fulcrum on the seesaw, if you will. Um, and then you can go out the spectrum uh, with managers. It isn't as simple as value core growth and in equal weights. I think um, we saw clients, especially early in my career, that were almost trained to demand balance. So if you have, you need to have 40% value managers, 40%, you know, uh, growth managers and 20% core, something like that. And if you vary from that, well, then you're taking a style bet. And it's it's like, no, 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 you could have that and have a massive overweight to fill in the blank, growth, value, sectors. So we're really looking for a high quality portfolio that has factor balance, exposure to the characteristics we want, which in some case are generally result in higher forecast growth, higher quality of the portfolio, lower levels of debt, 
especially in these small and micro cap spaces. Um, and, um, and we are able to balance some of the characteristics like sector exposures, et cetera. But in the end, really the focus is alpha. <laughs> the focus is excess return. And so uh, that comes from the deep manager research um, and the, the extensiveness of the process before you get to that stage. It's very helpful. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing yeah. all that. I'm not going to ask you which of your strategies is your favorite because I feel like it's asking me, it's like asking you who your favorite yeah, kid is. Yeah, I love is. all my children. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but if you had to think about the opportunity set right now in emerging market small cap relative to international small cap relative to U.S. micro, where are you finding some, some interesting areas of opportunity today? as it relates to your overall portfolio suite. You have to have some prioritization, I would Absolutely. assume, when you're talking with clients. So how would you prioritize that today? Well, I think it's a really, it's an outstanding time for small and micro cap in general. And that, uh, and globally, I think we're excited about, we've seen appetite for emerging market small cap, for example, from plans that are now in the advent of thinking about it uh, in, in terms of, you know, small and large, which, it's like the early days of the US when people went from thinking of just the S&P to thinking about, well, now maybe there's large and small and we'll think about it um, in that context and recognize the alpha potential of small. Um, there's great opportunity outside of the US uh, and, and uh, among our uh, international managers and our uh, emerging market small cap managers. In the US, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's also a really opportune time. Um, micro cap, as an example, is still 25% off its high and large cap, you know, the Dow is hitting new highs. And so you have this sort of bifurcation in the market um, that leads to an opportunity um, that we think our managers are optimally uh, set to take advantage of. So I think you know, we're, we're excited about a lot of things. We had a great year in 2023 and, um, and we had managers um, that were exceptional for us. And we saw a little bit of a, of a bounce in the smallest markets at the end of the year. But um, there are some things that are setting up really well for, um, for 2024 and some of the risk factors that have moderated a little bit in the broader context of the macro environment. Um, mean a better active environment for our managers. I love your open door policy, but I am curious, any active searches going on now? I mean, we're always looking. I, I would say that um, we have, in some ways, I think of ourselves as a solutions provider for the end client. And so we will have clients, in some cases, very large plans, ask us about certain asset areas and asset classes. And we've done work, we've done some great work in, uh, in emerging market small cap, um, not just on um, on specialist managers in that space, um, uh, not just broad managers, but you know, uh, country and regional specialists and things like that um, that we can put together. We have in uh, in U.S. small. We've been um, we don't have a current product, but we've been doing some work there um, that's been. Uh, uh, outstanding that leverages not only our history allocating to the space um, uh, with decades of experience there, but also uh, managers that we know uh, for a long time in microcap, often those emerged from superior small cap products mm -hmm. and processes. So um, we've been doing some work there as well. But really, if uh, if there is a manager in, in these products, small and microcap, we want to know you. And, mm -hmm. and we've gotten to the point where people recognize our expertise in the space, have recommended managers to us. We like to have an open door policy. Don't be afraid to reach out. Um, same thing with plan sponsors. If you're just looking to understand the space and we can be of any support for you in, in understanding what managers look like down there and uh, how folks uh, allocate and what liquidity looks like and all that sort mm -hmm of thing, um, we are glad to be a resource. Well, I'm going to ask you a question that get, I'm sure you ask most of your managers, which is what's your competitive edge? Our competitive advantage, I think, is our, our depth of research and our process. And that relates directly to the people that we have. Every individual at AQS, we are a four-person investment team and everyone is exceptional. Everyone loves researching investment managers and diving into the data and having discussions. Um, 
it, it is the most intellectually stimulating thing I have ever done because you see from a mile high all these wonderful minds um, focused on their own unique processes with the belief that what they are doing is more exceptional than what the next person is doing. Um, and it's not necessarily about ego as, as much as it is about their passion, right? And, and that passion is infectious. Um, and we think we can bring that, especially in an area like small and micro cap where um, these managers, they do have an advantage. They really can find uh, the gems. And so <clears throat> helping them discover, allocating money to them in their early days, helping them grow and seeing them create the next generation. Now we're onto multiple generations. We have people that are, you know, sons of founders and daughters of founders. And we have uh, managers that have spin out, spun out two, three times mm -hmm. that we have followed. Um, we have managers that were on the third, fourth iteration of our ex, uh, of our allocations that have been exceptional for us. Others that were truly emerging managers and diversity managers where we were the first assets to the manager that we're incredibly proud of and um, provided them access to large plans. Um, so that's really exciting. But really the um, the competitive advantage, I think, is, is the investment process of the diligence in uh, reaching out and doing the research early in the cycle for these products, being willing to be first to um, resource, to source and allocate to these investment managers um, and, and diving in deep. Um, and I think uh, it, it's the sort of thing where it's a little bit like, uh, you know, Warren Buffett and his his, his key to success. And he said, you know, read 500 pages a day. He's like, I know I'll say it and no one will do it. <laughs> but the, the in-depth research that we do in a way anyone can do, but no one will. Or, and, um, and I think that's an advantage for us. I think that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing all that. It's been really interesting and insightful getting this context from you with all of your experience. Uh, congratulations on all your success with Acuitas. We have a couple more questions that are more about you, but thank you for sharing all of that sure. insight into the process. And uh, you know, one of the questions that I'm always interested in, it's a quote that I pulled from last year that I'm, I'm, I'm carrying into 2024, but it's what you are is an expression of history. And I'm always so interested, as you said, you know, you've been with some of these managers now uh, for, for multi-generations and you've seen them through the highs and lows, but, but where does your history show up in your life today? Yeah, well, I think we were all products of our, uh, of our own history. Um, it, it is our, our experiences color our, our present initiatives. And when, when I look at investment managers, I think about the things that have gone wrong. I think about the things that that have gone right, um, and I think uh, and there's a great benefit to that. There's also benefit sometimes to saying, "Okay, I understand all the things that could go wrong, but I still need to move forward." Because it's like the quote. I can't remember exactly what it is about. You know, there there's magic in and in, in action. You know, um, things will fall into place that you never imagined, and that was the case in founding Acuitas. Um, there were things that fell into place that I never imagined people had helped us launch. Um, the same thing with delivering for our clients. There are managers that we sourced that we wouldn't have imagined knowing or allocating to in our early days that have been exceptional for us and helped generate our alpha. Um, we always look at things in the context of the environment that we're in. You know, more uh, sort of directly, mm -hmm. when we talk history, you know, we often talk about sort of years of like, oh, this is like summer of 07. This is like, and I know you've done that too. Um, but, uh, and cycles of, of when there's opportunity, much like, oh, we had a really dry spell for fill in the blank uh, value, you know, which we had come through in the not so distant past. Um, does that mean that value is done? We also saw white papers on, you know, is small cap dead? Mm -hmm and people giving up on small cap allocations. Um, we know that these things cycle, right? Um, so small cap is not dead. Small cap has underperformed. There's great opportunity in the space, opportunity for alpha in small and micro cap globally. And I think that colors our experience, but we're able to focus on the discipline of researching and allocating to managers 
with the benefit of of history and our own life experiences. I asked you earlier where your creative where your, where your creativity came <laughs> from. Where does your entrepreneurial spirit come from? I think it comes from my family. I think uh, my father and mother um, were both very involved. And uh, my father worked at uh, Dow Chemical for 45 years, um, um, but they also had a host of other uh, ventures. You know, they owned um, properties and had uh, opened a health club at one point, an arcade, which was fun for a middle schooler, um, you know, a health food store, all sorts of different things. And so um, they were, I think, a little bit of their fearlessness and sort of stepping off that ledge um, rubbed off. And I always wanted to... Um, to try and do something, build something like a QS. I didn't know I'd be surrounded by so many great people and be supported by so many folks, um, which has been really the the magic of all of it. But um, but I think that's where it, that's where it initially came from. I uh, you know they asked in business school. I think one of the essays was write your own retirement speech, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or or you know your own wake or something yeah, like that. Yeah, I was like, this is morbid. Yeah, but that the, eulogy has yeah. been coming out more and more these <laughs> right, days. Right, exactly. <laughs> We're I'm feeling super comfortable. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm a little less comfortable writing that now. Yeah. Um, but the uh, um, but I talked about in that launching an asset management firm, and so. Uh, I think I had the genesis of the idea for a long time before the people around me helped to make it real. In addition to your colleagues, who were some of those people? Who were some of those mentors? You mentioned early on in your career uh, back in the Lehman Bear Stearns days. But um, if you think about the, the folks, in addition to your family, who, who helped you along the way? Yeah, well, there were, there were a lot of great people. I mean, my very first job at Lehman Brothers, uh, Nick Rebecki, was, uh, um, was a great mentor in teaching me about uh, portfolios and about how, how much relationships with people matter in the industry. Just simple things like a relationship with, uh, with multiple salespeople that can provide you, you know, access to the best bonds and ideas and source ideas and really understand what you're looking for um, can be a benefit. And the... Uh, um, in my Russell days, uh, Paul Greenwood has been a great mentor for me, um, who's now CEO of Pacific Current Group and uh, Venture Capital Group that is a um, multi-asset manager boutique. And, um, and you know, like I said, Paul uh, gave me that quote of, you know, there's no shortage of, uh, of capital out there and, and helped me take that first step. Um, there have been lots of folks that, uh, and the colleagues I work with now, you know, uh, my business partner, Dennis, um, has great context into what are the characteristics that make a manager work that they require in a certain environment. A deep value manager requires something very different than a high growth manager and their discipline to actually have success. Mm -hmm. And so you need to suss that out in the investment process. And so I think, you know, in anything you do, you need to sort of continue to seek knowledge and surround yourself with people that make you better. Um, and I'm just really blessed to be in that position. That's wonderful. Or find a good book. Yeah, that's right. Or find a good book. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> no you. question. Lots of great books uh, that uh, we've drawn from. Well, there were a lot of great insights in this conversation. Thank you again. Congratulations on all your success. Well, thanks very much. Yeah, I appreciate it. If you want to learn more about Chris and Acuitous Investments, please visit their website at www.acuitousinvestments.com. You can find this episode and past episodes on Spotify, Apple, or your favorite podcast platform. We are also available on YouTube if you prefer to watch while you listen. If you'd like to catch up on past episodes, check out our website at decoded.com. Finally, if you like what you're hearing and seeing, please be sure to like, follow, and subscribe. We welcome your feedback as well. Chris, thank you again for joining us today. And to our audience, thank you for investing your time with Dakota. Don't say goodbye. This material contains the current opinions of Acuitas and is presented solely for informational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice, or recommendation or solicitation to buy, sell, or hold a security. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identified and described were or will be profitable. Information is obtained from sources deemed reliable, but there is no representation or warranty as to its accuracy, completeness, or reliability. All information is current as of the date of this material and is subject to change without notice. Past performance is not a guarantee of future returns. 
Investing in securities involves risks of loss that investors should be prepared to bear.